Hello and welcome once again to Solo Board Gaming Presents. The fate of writers is today's game. Writers as in riders. Uh, five battles of the French Wars of Religion, 1562 to 1598. Uh, again, uh, an education. It's been an education reading the rule book, the background to it, the designer notes. Um, and I've been doing some research online, as you do, uh, to get some background into uh, the wars of uh, uh, religion, remembering that at the time, for instance, uh, in Britain, Elizabeth I was on the throne, uh, on the throne, but Europe was in turmoil um, due to the wars of religion between uh, the Catholics and the Protestants and uh, Huguenots. Uh, this is a game, uh, I was really pumped to receive this uh, just yesterday from Exasim uh, and designed by Philippe RD. And it's a second game in the series by Shot, Shock and Faith. Um, I was after at one point the first iteration of the series um, that tends to get called uh, P3F. Or par le feu, le fer et le foi. By shot, shock and faith. Although I believe, um, I thought I'm going to look this up. And <laughs> the literal translation is by fire, iron and faith. But I can see that shot, shock and faith. Superb. And some beautiful uh, cover art once again there uh, of these writers uh, on their steeds fully armed. In fact, what, 60, 70 years later, uh, English Civil War, um, some of you may be very well aware of Hassel Riggs uh, 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 lobsters, uh, the fully armoured um, uh, uh, cavalry um, who used pistols at close range. And um, uh, here we actually see them in the previous century. Uh, most of them tended to be German. Um, fantastic picture there, really love that, really evocative of the age. So, uh, some quick look of what's on the other side of the box. Um, this is an example of one of the maps, really that absolutely beautiful, you could frame these things. Uh, some of the uh, uh, counters uh, where the art is equally fantastic and an explanation of the game. Um, it's a two-player game, um, but the design makes it perfect for solo uh, without any problem whatsoever. Um, and I think each turn uh, is meant to be uh, 20 to 30 minutes of real time, that is. Uh, that's what each turn represents. Um, each counter represents a hundred to five hundred men, so it's a fairly good scale. Um, and then each area uh, on the maps, but we'll cover this more in a second, is three to five hundred um, uh, meters. One of the things that really impressed me about this game actually uh, was uh, the rule book. Um, it's a fantastic rule book. Uh, really enjoyed this. The rules are, let me see, remind myself, 12, including the advanced rules, about 15 pages, yeah, about 15 pages of rules, and then you have some uh, really nice uh, explanations of the rules uh, towards the back here, like so. Um, and the uh, design notes, which I found invaluable, actually. Um, but just a quick look back at uh, back at the rules. They're beautifully written and set out. Um, they explain the counters. Uh, it's nicely spaced. It's large text. Very easy to understand, and I mean very easy to understand. Uh, it, it was an absolutely absolute pleasure to read 
uh, last night when it came, although I did cover all the rules for at least a week before. I was reading them avidly um, on the, uh, the the PDF version um, of the uh, Le Feu, Le Fer et Le Foi um, at first iteration. So as you can see, the rules are beautifully set out. Uh, nice illustrations, lovely tables uh, explaining this really quite unique system uh, that they use here and the system is taking some getting used to. Not that it's difficult at all in fact, it's just extremely different, I mean it's very very different. Uh, but as you can see a lovely uh, uh, glossy uh, rule book uh, full of colour um, and a joy to read. Uh, what else do we get in the box? We get a couple of player aid cards. Let's take that out of the way. Um, they're both the same. So a couple of player aid cards, uh, which again, oh dear, oh dear. Um, uh, again, it, it, it's simplicity itself, the way it sets out in tables, terrain costs and effects of all the different kinds of terrain look. And then on the inside, we have terrain modifiers, a summary here of various units against which kind of terrain or border. I nearly said hex border then, but border. Um, there are no hexes as such in this game. Um, and then you've got the uh, combat results table uh, that's common in um, uh, many games. When you first look at this one, because of all the modifiers, uh, it starts to look quite complicated, but honestly, it's really not. Um, so that's really, really nice. I like that. So there's two of those um, uh, player aid sheets. And then we have, just excuse me a second, the scenarios. Uh, there are five scenarios in this game. And, and, and I notice how the first one starts at scenario number six, because in the... Uh, first of these games, uh, the P3F, um, uh, the scenarios are one to five. And the scenarios, uh, these, each one of these cards is a scenario instruction. So it'll give you some of the background, which is nice. The victory conditions for the Catholics and the Protestants. These tend to be fairly asymmetrical. And when you take a look actually at some of the forces involved, they look incredibly, most of them anyway, not all, uh, unbalanced. So the victory conditions are there to balance them. And it makes each game into a heck of a puzzle. That's the way I can see it. It's a real puzzle, some of these games. How on earth can one side or the other, depending on the scenario, get anything out of this position they're in? Shows us the uh, victory level and the victory point track. Each scenario will also have some uh, rules that are individual to that particular scenario as well. And then on the back, uh, it'll give us um, a very, very simply look uh, which forces for the Catholics and for the Protestants are involved. Uh, and actually shows us the individual counters, uh, shows us which map to use. And I like this bit. Whereabouts geographically was that location? Uh, on the map of France itself at that time. Absolutely great. Um, I really like those. Next, we have a couple of lovely counter sheets. Only the two counter sheets, but look at these for quality. In fact, uh, these are the Catholic in the sort of pale blue. These are the Protestant in the white. I think we need to get closer down to have a bit of a closer look at these counter sheets. That's a lot better now. So let's have a look at the Catholic sheet first in this lovely light blue colour. The artwork is straight out of the Renaissance. Uh, it's so elegant look and classical. It makes a real change. Uh, nice rounded corners, uh, quality card, um, and a really, really nice finish and some fantastic units here. Um, 
We've got general units, Mandalo, De Guise, Saint Paul, uh, De Laval. Fantastic artwork. And the sheer amount of different kinds of units. There's so many different kinds. I think I've, 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 I've seen it uh, referred to as very much a transitional era where we still had fully armoured cavalry charging with lances. Absolutely still charging with lances just as they did 100 and 150 years before that. Like here, for instance, on these French units where you've got the gendarmes, that's what they were, fully armoured um, uh, knights with lances, partially armoured horses. Um, there's other kinds of cavalry, the chevaux légers, which I think are these ones here. Uh, lighter cavalry. I mean, they're still armoured, um, but their horses aren't. And then you've got the forerunners of the dragoons. I really like these. And on the other side is, is the dismounted version. Um, those were the argulet, uh, the forerunners of, of dragoons. And then you've got arquebusier, uh, or musket men, as they would become, pikemen. So you've got this really strange mixture of different kinds of weapons and combat units. And that's what makes this game so fascinating as regards tactics on the battlefield. We quickly have a look at some of the Protestant counters. Uh, here you've got orders counters, by the way, uh, because orders can be given to your different battles, your different columns. Uh, Oh, that's in French. I'm going to turn it around <laughs> and take a look on the back uh, to find the English version. There we are. Attack, hold, retreat, reserve, march, skirmish, disengage. Uh, and on the back of the units, there's the step loss um, uh, side. Um, Protestants here have some cannon. Uh, I think they were, were they bronze cannon at that time? Um, and again, mounted units here. Uh, these are the writers, the, G the German writer units. Um, uh, musketeers here, or what were they called again? Arquebusier. Um, I think that's right. And I really love these. Um, most of us tend to be aware of, for instance, uh, in the middle of the next century, middle of the 17th century, the English Civil War, uh, of the Forlorn Hope, that band of brave skirmishers that you had put out in front of your main battle <laughs> to try and, uh, well, to recce and also to try and break up uh, any attack. Well, there's an equivalent here. Here are their predecessors in the French wars of religion. These are les enfants perdus. Les enfants perdus. The lost children. The forlorn hope. So small bands of skirmishers that can go out ahead of your line uh, to break up um, uh, any particular uh, battle coming towards them. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so where do we fight? We're going to fight on five of the best looking maps I've seen in a long time. And for that, we need to pan out again. See you back up there. Much better. Here's one of the maps. Um, it's for the Battle of, what did it say, the Vimory, 26th of October, 1587. Um, I don't know if you agree with me, um, but as I said at the start of this, it's one of those kind of maps you could almost frame. It's so evocative of the times, and I don't know if it shows well enough from this particular height, but it's not an absolute top-down. It's a slight angle, as if you're sort of flying in from 
from this angle. Uh, there's a slight 3D-ness, uh, no such word, but there you go. Uh, for instance, of these buildings and of the trees um, and the bushes, uh, as if you're flying in, I don't know, at an angle of 30 degrees, 20, 25, 30 degrees or something like that. But beautiful, beautiful colours. Um, it makes such a refreshing change. The first thing you will also notice is that there's no hexes. So, there are all these uh, squares. No, they're not squares, are they? They're um, uh, zones of all different shapes and sizes. And that's quite deliberate based on, uh, based on the going, based on the ground, based on the terrain features, that kind of thing. Uh, these yellow uh, boxes... In fact, if I can zoom down a little bit more, we might be able to see a little bit better. I hope that's sort of um, uh, more or less focused. Uh, each of the zones has these uh, uh, small boxes in the middle. Um, the first number in any of the boxes is the uh, elevation. So that's elevation zero. Okay, so it's all pretty flat, isn't it, around here. The Roman numerals at the bottom is for the terrain type uh, and how easy or difficult it is to traverse that terrain. And here it is on the map. You don't have to look it up. So number one costs one movement point. Two cost two movement points, two movement points, two movement points, and so on. The actual um, uh, numerals here look tw uh, 20, 21, 34. That's just the number of the actual zone um, uh, for reference within the game. So uh, we have a village, which is two difficulty. It costs two um, to move into this zone. Uh, and it's elevation zero. Uh, I think most of this map that I can see first off is elevation zero. Let's discuss maps some more. Let's have a look on the other side. Oh, completely different now. Um, I'm going to zoom out again a little bit. There we go. Okay. Uh, this is for the Battle of Alno, uh, 24th of November, 1587. And again, you see the same sort of setup. Uh, a lot of forested areas here, uh, a lot of wetland, uh, sort of marshy areas um, at the side of the uh, river. Now, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, th this is level one terrain. That's level zero terrain, level zero terrain. So you can see that's quite low terrain bordering the river, which is why there's some flooding there, up to level one. I don't know if we have any level two or three terrain. We do have that in the game, but I can't see any on this particular map. Okay, so this terrain here, we see the Roman numeral, uh, numeral, numeral even, <laughs> one. Uh, so this costs one uh, to move into. That one costs two movement points to move into. The hex sides, the dotted line, which are, which is always the default, is no extra cost to cross. Um, and we might see if we can find a few more examples of where the the uh, uh, the zone borders. Um, actually do affect uh, movement. So let's try the next map. Dun, dun, dun. What have we got here? Ooh, okay. Dormant, Dormans, Dormant. 10th of October, 1575. Um, again, uh, fairly low lying terrain. This is this costs one movement point to enter. This costs two. This area here 
which is bordered by this thick yellow line. It's its its own zone, and it has an X in it, which means it's impossible. So you can't enter that zone. You can cross here. That looks like a Ford. That yellow line there shows that it's, it's an extra movement point to cross. So from there to there is one movement point, two movement points to get across here. Another two movement points to get into there because it shows number two and so on. Um, I hope this, this shows up here, look. Um, it would cost one movement point to come into this zone. Another three to get into this forested area, so that's four. But we crossed this solid border, so that's five. Okay. Um, and when you start paying more points to enter certain types of terrain, that's when we're taking quality checks or automatic disruption, which is in the case of this. And that makes absolute sense. So another beautiful map there, Dormont. Let's have a look at this one. Cognac. I think this is Cognac nowadays, something like that. A uh, beautiful forested area here. We've got a river to cross um, and so on. So that's four of the larger maps. There's one very small map. Uh, for a game that just lasts, I think, four turns. There we go. That's the smallest scenario uh, in the game. And this is Mature, um, which is going to be a very, very difficult one, actually. Um, very, very small units. Um, trying to get home after battle and being run down and intercepted by larger opposing forces. So there you go, fantastic maps for this wonderful game in this series of Shot, Shock and Faith from Exasim. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing a, um, uh, a how to play playthrough of the small scenario uh, very very soon um, I'm going to start playing immediately after this uh, video so we'll finish up there now but I'm really pumped really pleased uh, to have uh, the fate of writers by Philippe RD from Exasim thanks for watching see you soon